Hey there, Leslie here, and today I want to talk to you about anti-aging and timeless beauty secrets from Japan. So some of you may know that I am half Taiwanese. My mother comes from Taiwan, which uh, was a colony of Japan for 50 years, but as an island, it shares a lot of the same ancestral culinary traditions with Japan. And many of them are health promoting, but also beauty promoting. And I wanted to share some of these with you and you might be able to incorporate some of them into your daily regimen as well. So the first one I want to talk to you about is something called natto. Now it's a tofu, but there are really three different kinds of tofu. There's regular silken tofu, um, or just tofu that you get at the supermarket and it's not going to be fermented. The second kind is fermented. It tends to be um, denser in consistency, has more of an al dente bite to it. And the third kind, which is known as natto, is long fermented uh, tofu. And in Okinawa, which is the island off the southern coast of Japan, that has the highest per capita percentage of centenarians in the world, they eat a lot of this long fermented natto, um, which they, uh, they mature in limestone caves for around a year. Now, the reason why it has anti-aging properties, scientists have uh, put down to a polyamine called spermidine. And spermidine triggers something called autophagy, which won the Nobel Prize in 2016 when Yoshinori Ozumi, a Japanese scientist, explained its mechanism of action. And uh, cellular renewal and repair is absolutely critical to our own survival, but also to how we look and how we feel, uh, whether or not our cells are able to uh, have mitochondria that are functioning optimally and making ATP, adenosine triphosphate, um, which is the source of energy for us. That's the sort of energy currency that we need in order to have a sense of vitality and vigor. So spermidine in natto is absolutely fantastic. The only problem is that Natto, a bit like Stilton cheese in the UK, is an acquired taste, texture, and smell. It's really stinky. Western friends of mine who have smelled it before have said it's like, um, it's like old socks that you know some rugby player uh, stomped around in and then just left in his kit bag for ten days and didn't bother washing. <laughs> which really doesn't make it sound appealing. But um, sometimes the best things are really not very appetizing. Maybe it's a little bit like the liposomal glutathione. Um, I don't actually have any to show you today because uh, it's locked down and it's also, it's kind of hard to get, but you can look in specialty Asian food stores. You can ask if they might have someone who makes it I doubt that you will find anyone who will ferment it for as long as a year, but you can get powdered versions of spermidine, which might be a good substitute. So that's the first anti-aging food that I wanna talk about. The next one is something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is, um, I've got my little tea canister out here, um, and it is, green tea. So um, in particular, if you get matcha, which is ceremonial grade green tea, and I've got some matcha here in my special matcha bowl, and you can kind of see how bright green it is. It looks like wheatgrass, right? Or barley grass. And we know how nutrient dense those are. Well, this is full of polyphenols. It's very good against free radicals um, and is absolutely, um, you know, full of nutrients to, uh, to help support us and our skin, very good for collagen production. Uh, one of the ways that you can actually get the lumps out, because I know a lot of you say, oh, I bought a bunch of matcha, but it's really lumpy and gritty, 
is to use a whisk. So this is, they're not too expensive, a bamboo whisk, and you literally just add some hot water in, froth it up with, with the whisk, and it's, it's in fact really relaxing, so it's kind of meditative. And this is, of course, what they do in the Japanese tea ceremony, which itself, if you've ever seen it, is a meditation. And it's really good for us. I mean, I've got a whole list of reasons why it's actually good for us. Um, you know, it promotes microcirculation, which benefits everything from the way cellulite appears on our thighs to, uh, you know, to how nourished our skin looks. It helps reduce sagging and wrinkling. Uh, and it also protects, protects against uh, photo damage that we might get from, uh, from UV light in the sun. Um, it's also good at reducing dandruff and keeping sebum production down if you've got any of that sort of adult onset acne, which, you know, any of you who are over 50 like me and start getting a little bit of acne, it's so frustrating because you think this not menopause and acne, right? So green tea may be a way to get around that. The next thing I want to talk about, I've again, I've only got a photo of this, is jellyfish. Yeah, jellyfish. I hear you say, here's a, here's a picture of a jellyfish dish. And I grew up with jellyfish. So you can get it at an Asian supermarket. It will be, uh, it'll be flat, dry, and it will frankly look like a jellyfish. And what you need to do, because it's preserved in a ton of salt, is you need to soak it so that it uh, sort of, you know, uh, reconstitutes itself. And you need to rinse it five to seven times and then slice it very thinly. And what you'll get are what I used to call rubber bands. And the, um, the Taiwanese and the Japanese will pickle it with a little bit of lemon juice or vinegar, uh, maybe rice wine vinegar, and they will add some sesame oil, some sesame seeds, maybe some very thinly julienned uh, cucumbers, ginger, carrots, and it's a really wonderful cold appetizer. However, it's packed full of protein and it's packed full of, uh, full of collagen as well. So it's very good for your skin, your joints, your tendons, your ligaments, but it's also a great way of filling you up with a protein without filling you out. So it's known for its slimming properties. If you can get around the fact that it's jellyfish, it's a wonderful addition to your culinary repertoire. We're also getting a lot of jellyfish blooms right now because of global warming. And uh, scientists in, food scientists in Italy have actually said that this would be harvesting these, uh, these jellyfish blooms would be a great way to feed people uh, something that's nutrient dense uh, they don't mention that it's beauty promoting, but it is, and uh, in a very ecological manner. So do take a look into, uh, into jellyfish. So one more glimpse of that. So in addition to the collagen boosting benefits of jellyfish, which comes from the sea, there's another thing from the sea, which Asians eat a lot of, and particularly the Japanese, and you'll recognize this as seaweed. Um, I've been eating jellyfish and seaweed since I was about three, and there are multiple types of seaweed. This one, uh, which is known as, it doesn't sound very good, it's known as laver. I just, just seaweed is fine. Um, this one is toasted, and but you can also get it in flakes. And these particular flakes actually come from Ireland. So now the Spanish, the Irish, and the Welsh have gotten involved in harvesting seaweed and very similar to what those Italian scientists, food scientists were saying about the ecological benefits of eating jellyfish. Well, they also apply to seaweed as well. But what's terrific about seaweed is that it's packed full of tyrosine and iodine. Now, iodine is really important for thyroid health. 
you don't want too much, but the majority of, majority of us tend to get too little. Uh, in some countries like the United States, iodized salt is the standard, but it's not the standard in all countries. For example, here in the UK, it's not. You really have to look for iodized salt. So uh, in Britain, we can get it from Cerebos, that salt, um, in the orange, what's the yellow and red label, but uh, you can also get it from this. I tend to have it as a paste. So this one is actually a paste from Taiwan and it's made from thousands of sheets of seaweed. And you can see, well, I've kind of nearly eaten it up, but you just take a spoonful of this and you'd put it on your rice together with uh, some sesame seeds, which I'll get to next, with some umeboshi plums and uh, a little bit of medium chain triglycerides to turn the cooled boiled white rice into a prebiotic fiber. So those are the benefits of seaweed. Now I'll get on to umeboshi plums, which I was just talking to about. So umeboshi looks like this. Uh, ume just means plum. And these are, they, basically they look like apricots. Uh, they're harvested in June, at which point they are usually pickled or uh, preserved and turned into what's known as salty plums. And um, umeboshi plums, uh, this dark bit, the dusky bit are the plums, the dark bit are actually some leaves that have been preserved and they're really yummy and salty. Um, what's great about umeboshi is that it has a lot of polyphenols that help support collagen production. And you can get it also as a paste. You can see this looks almost like applesauce. Mm, it smells really good. It's kind of like a cross. I just don't, not, it's, it's not like yuzu or anything like that. Not like Japanese lemon. It is, it's like a very weak applesauce, a salty applesauce. Does that make sense? And I, I don't know if that sounds, if that puts you off or not, but it supports collagen function. So you want this, right? Um, and the other thing about it is that it has citric acid, which will inhibit the H. pylori bacteria. So some of you have seen my other videos where I talk about how common the H. pylori bacteria is, how in some countries up to 80% of populations will have H. pylori present. And while it's not necessarily bad to have H. pylori present, if those colonies become overgrown, they can strip out the iron in our bodies, which is very bad, can lead to anemia. But they also inhibit the absorption of all nutrients, in particular vitamin B12, which is implicated in low mood and depression. Now, loss of both iron and B12 together are themselves implicated in gray hair. So keeping H. pylori under control by having things like um, green tea, I forgot to mention that green tea will also inhibit H. pylori, uh, apple cider vinegar, cabbage juice, but also something like umeboshi plum paste is a great way to just mix things in your diet up. You know, why not try a bunch of different flavors? All of them are going to, all of those four things that I just mentioned will help keep the H. pylori colonies under control. While at the same time, this is going to boost production of collagen. I think that's a pretty good trade-off, right? So then the next thing I want to talk about are sesame seeds. So this is a brand I love. You've seen a number of the things that I've been using today are from Sanchi. This is a British brand. They source directly from Japan. Everything is organic. They're very, very picky about the quality of the ingredients that they use. And I'm just going to show you the bottom of the bottle here so you can see what's inside. There are white sesame seeds, black sesame seeds, uh, a few seaweed flakes and some umeboshi plum flakes. And this just adds um, some really nice flavor and texture to any dish. You know, you could sprinkle this on top of fish, you could sprinkle it on top of salads, on top of rice. Uh, you could make your own little hand roll with some seaweed sheets, rice, and this inside. And um, what's terrific about it is that not only do you get the benefits of umeboshi and seaweed, but 
there is a lot of oleic acid in sesame seeds. And it's not surprising that black sesame paste is associated with skin health and beauty in Asia because of the high oleic acid content of all sesame seeds. And they've even been known to soothe and not just, uh, you know, superficially inflamed skin, but really serious skin conditions like rosacea, psoriasis, and eczema. So if you suffer from any of those conditions or you just want to make sure that maybe you've been out in the sun, maybe you've gotten a little too much sun, have some sesame seeds because the oleic acid um, in these will help. Of course, oleic acid, also one of the compounds in olive oil. So very good for you that way. The final thing I want to talk to you about today is miso. So how is miso a superfood? Most of you will know miso from going into Japanese restaurants. You know that it's the first thing that, uh, that you're given along with uh, some pickled uh, fermented cabbage maybe. Uh, well, miso, when you don't pour boiling water over it, actually is a great source of probiotics. Now, the strains of probiotics are going to vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. And in Japan, it's like an art. They have manufacturers who have been in these uh, wooden buildings where the miso is made, and these are made actually in wooden vats. Those wooden buildings surrounding the vats are meant to be very important because they have certain bacterial spores in them, which then become part of the miso. And I'll just show you this one. This is a really nice brand. <clears throat> it's unfermented, it's, um, it's fermented and it's not pasteurized. And you can see where I've just taken a teaspoon into it and I'll just have a little bit neat but you can also add it onto a tiny bit of rice. Again, I always have my rice cooled, so cooled, boiled rice, white rice, can become a prebiotic, um, which means food for the microorganisms, for the probiotics. And uh, if you think about it, having some probiotics together with a little bit of cooled, boiled white rice that becomes a prebiotic um, is a great way to establish new colonies of bacteria in your gut, these new bacteria will actually outcompete or try, they will compete for space in the gut with less good bacteria. For example, H. pylori. So um, what, is, what is terrific about all of the things that I've shown you today is that they're all food, right? You can just incorporate some of these into your daily food regimen. You don't have to have all of them, but every now and then, maybe try one, you know? Think about um, green tea, for instance, right? You could even take a little bit of matcha, throw it into your smoothie. You probably won't notice it. Um, it also is a great source of caffeine and L-theanine, which is more of a relaxant. So instead of getting that buzz that some people get off of caffeine, if you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, the L-theanine will sort of zen you out and balance that out. But you know, you could try a little bit of umeboshi paste. This probably would go well with something like a pork dish or a fish dish um, with some vegetables, but it's, you know, it's more of a sour taste, a mellow sour taste. And it has a lot of health benefits, obviously promotes collagen, but also is a terrific taste as well. I suppose the only thing that is a little hard, the only two things that are a little hard to get that I've talked about today would be the natto and the jellyfish. But, um, you know, natto, you can find spermidine powders and uh, you can incorporate them into your smoothies and uh, you know, get all the benefits to heart health, brain health, uh, to lungs, and uh, all of the beauty benefits to hair and nails that spermidine give you just by adding that into your smoothie. With jellyfish, well, the high collagen content, of course, we could get from just having grass-fed collagen too. So I hope that, uh, that this video today has given you some ideas 
on how to make use of Japanese foods in your daily diet and also get an extra boost of an extra beauty and a timeless glow boost from all of them at the same time. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. You know, I do my very best to answer each and every one of them. And I always love engaging with you guys. So look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.